Hello and welcome to Weathersnap. It's Thursday the 8th of December and I'm Claire Nazir. Joining me today, Aidan McGiven. Now Aidan, first question, we're not far off Christmas are we? What's the most common question you've been asked during any interview this past week? Everyone wants to know, will it snow where I am? And actually in the immediate future, for most people, the answer is no. But into next week, things start to get a bit more interesting and a lot more uncertain. And actually, it's all down to a potential tropical storm over the mid-Atlantic. And that could play a very important but indirect role on our weather into next week. We'll have more on that in a moment. That's quite interesting. I've done a lot of interviews on the radio this last few days. And one thing they haven't asked is whether there is a storm across the mid-Atlantic. But as you say, it could have indirect implications across the UK in some shape or form going into next week. Very interesting setup there. And we'll be talking more about that in a moment. First of all, let's talk about the bigger picture across the UK, because for the last 11 months, temperatures across the UK have been above average. Q December, Q meteorological winter, and oh my goodness, it's Baltic outside. Temperatures by night have been dipping down to minus four, minus six degrees Celsius. And the bigger picture speaks volumes of why the air is so cold. So currently we have quite a large area of high pressure centred across Greenland and a fairly sort of broad area of low pressure across Scandinavia. And that's dragging in air from the Arctic. So currently we have Arctic maritime air streaming from the north across the UK. And that's what has allowed the temperatures to really plummet. And through the next few days where you've seen snow, temperatures are likely to dip down to negative double digits. So, you know, minus 10, minus 11 degrees Celsius. Here in the UK, Aidan, we just love to talk about the snow, don't we? So first of all, tell me why in this sort of setup there are more showers across the sea than the land. Because if you look at a satellite picture or even a radar, they're frequent across the sort of coastal waters just around uh, the islands of the UK. And a few are penetrating further inland. Yeah, you mentioned it's been so warm this year so far and sea temperatures surrounding the UK at the moment are way above average. So those warm seas are currently fueling quite a number of showers. We saw that over the weekend with easterly winds bringing showers into the east. The winds have now changed to northerlies, so it's places that are exposed to the northerly wind that will see showers over the next few days. Northern Scotland in particular, but also North Sea Coast, Irish Sea Coast. Now, the reason that we get all these showers in a northerly wind is because of instability in the atmosphere. Instability means that the temperature is falling really quite quickly as you go higher up in the atmosphere. So it's like putting a pan of water on the stove to boil. When you've got that heat from below, you get this rising air and you get showers developing. And the heat source at the moment is from the seas because we've got much warmer seas than land at the moment. So that's why the northerly, as it arrives, this cold plunge from the Arctic, it moves over warm seas and it picks up the moisture, but also this energy from below leads to rising air currents, cloud formation and numerous showers. So it really depends on the wind direction to where we see most of these showers. And obviously disturbances within the in the pattern brings frequent showers which run down one side or the other of the UK. But generally speaking, that weather warning we've seen, that the snow and ice warning, which has been across the northern third of Scotland for the last few days, is suggesting up to 10 centimetres over the higher ground, two to five centimetres at lower levels. The distribution is likely to change over the next few days, Aidan. Yeah, like you say, subtle changes in wind direction will bring showers to different parts of the UK, a bit more of an easterly direction and you get showers coming into the east of England uh, to affect parts of the Pennines, the North York Moors and so on. And so we could see over the next couple of days some significant snow accumulations across parts of northern England, southeast Scotland and at lower levels, perhaps down the east coast of England, although immediate coasts, I think we'll mostly see sleety showers and no real significant snow building up. Likewise, Irish sea coasts prone to some showers. So that includes parts of Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and even parts of Devon, where a few flakes of snow couldn't be ruled out for the likes of Exmoor. Likewise, away from those exposed coasts, It'll just be sunny skies. Northerly winds are quite clean winds. And so for many, it will be brighter skies, that crisp winter sunshine that a lot of people enjoy. But of course, clear skies at night will lead to very low temperatures widely across the UK. My garden this morning was white 
because it was just so cold overnight. And slippery conditions are going to be really affecting more of the population, really. If you've seen showers overnight, then yes, it's going to ice over. And there are ice warnings in force across the west as well as the eastern uh, strip of the country through the next few days. So keep an eye on those warnings because they'll be updated right the way through this cold spell. I was talking to somebody uh, from Scotland the other day on the radio and she said, well, I went for a dip in the in the seas across Western Scotland just the other day and it was wonderful. So that's the first thing I think is quite interesting. You know, the relative warmth of the sea relative to how cold it is in the air. The other thing is, is that on the radar recently, I've seen a sort of a string of showers. This is over the last day or so just running down the Irish Sea. It brings me on to this phenomena, uh, occasionally spotted on the radar, which could be spotted over the next few days. It's the Pembrokeshire Dangler. Yes, it's a strange name, ladies and gentlemen, but it does really dangle across the Irish Sea, clipping Pembrokeshire, which sticks out towards the southwest of Wales and can produce quite a lot of showers. It doesn't move very far, very fast. And it occurs, doesn't it, Aidan, in this type of airstream? Yeah, if you imagine the northerly winds funneling through the Irish Sea, where those winds then converge together, you get more rising air because they're pushing into each other, they're forced to rise. And that's where you get this line of showers called a convergence line. And it just so happens that that convergence line then ends up pointing towards Pembrokeshire and you get shower after shower across Pembrokeshire. And at the moment, those showers could be consisting of a wintry nature. So rain, seas around coasts and perhaps some snow inland. But on a radar map, it certainly does look like a dangling line of showers, hence its name. It has a unique symbol on a synoptic map. So anyone who uh, has a sort of curiosity for meteorological things, check out the Met Office synoptic maps over the next few days. And you may see a little line etched with these other little short lines which sort of just converge and that sort of depicts the convergence of the winds just from the north northwest or just from the north northeast now in a moment we'll be talking about something else happening which is quite unusual for this time of year across the mid-atlantic but before that it's 70 years since the great smog of london or the great smog of 1952 where a severe air pollution event affected much of london and it all started off with a very cold spell of air at this time of year. I found out more from Met Office archivist, Dr. Catherine Ross. Catherine, 1952. First of all, tell me in December, what were the weather conditions like? The key thing we had in early December, between the the 5th and the 9th of December, was a high pressure, an anticyclone settled over particularly the London and the southeast of England, created a temperature inversion whereby cooler air was trapped underneath a layer of warmer air so it couldn't rise. The clear skies on the morning of the 5th created ideal conditions for something we call radiation fog. So essentially it created a 200 metre thick layer of fog that created the position for the smog to then happen. So the high pressure acted as almost like a blanket or a lid, keeping what you say, the smog within that lowest layer of the atmosphere. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, it was a lid over, especially over London. OK, this happens quite a lot. In winter, we see high pressure, but this was significant. Yeah, this was this was different. I mean, London had seen fog before. It had seen smog before. But this event was different. Um And it was a combination of of factors, really. One, it was also very cold. So you've got thousands and thousands of houses all burning coal and burning more coal because it got very cold. Added to that, the coal that they were burning was very impure, very low quality. The reason for that was because after the Second World War, Britain had a large war debt. And part of paying that off involved selling their best quality coal abroad. So here in the UK, what was left essentially was very poor quality coal, which gave off all sorts of nasty impurities and um, pollutants. So that was a big issue. Added to that, you had power stations like Battersea also burning coal. You had factories and you had transport, buses, cars burning very polluting uh, fuels at that time. So that meant that on each day during the smog, 1,000 tonnes of smoke particles were emitted, 2,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide, 140 tonnes of hydrochloric acid and 14 tonnes of fluorine. 
And in addition, perhaps most dangerously, 370 tonnes of sulphur dioxide, which combined with the water particles from the fog, created 800 tonnes of sulfuric acid. Now, you don't want to be breathing that in. Absolutely toxic and not only detrimental to human life, but lethal. Absolutely lethal. Yeah. I mean, you could see it. It was yellow because of the tar in the smog. It came into people's houses. It was so thick that it got through the windows. So there was no escape even inside. The public transport system shut down. So one of the problems was it was lethal because you couldn't see where you were going and people were getting knocked over and run down. So there were road traffic accidents in addition to the impacts of just breathing in that lethal smog. You talk about car accidents and the amount of people who really just couldn't see where they were going and coughing. But also, I'm sure crime rates probably went up as well. They did. There was a lot of looting, a lot of break-ins. There are accounts of, of police officers who were on the beat at the time who could he- they would hear this event happening, but they couldn't see where it was and they couldn't see the culprits run away. Even if they were only a few metres from them, they couldn't actually stop it. I remember my grandmother, who's now 98, talking about the 1952 smog and saying she would wake her children up in the morning. She lived in central London and they'd be caked full of dirt around their mouths where they'd been coughing and trying to sleep. And she said it was just the most horrific and scary thing. It was particularly difficult for the more vulnerable, so the elderly, anybody with pre-existing health conditions uh, or lung conditions, um, and some of the youngest as well. But the, uh, the ambulances couldn't find their way either. They had to stop. So you couldn't get to hospital. There was no ambulance to take you there. So it was really a horrendous combination of circumstances. How many people died? At the time, it was thought to be about 4,000. But actually, the the whole event was reassessed in 2004, and they now think it was as many as 12,000 people. My goodness. So, Catherine, the wind change happened around the 9th, 10th, which obviously cleaned the air to a point. But rules and regulations, that didn't transition until much later. Yeah, that took much longer to take effect. So there was immediate understanding that something had to be done. I mean, you can't be back at a situation where people can't see more than a metre in front of them. But um, the first Clean Air Act was passed in 1956. So that's, you know, we're looking four years after the event. And the second Clean Air Act, not until 1968. So it took a long time, really, to change so much. My thanks to Dr Catherine Ross. Let's now move towards the west of the UK, where the winds are decidedly stronger. In fact, something slightly unusual for this time of year. And we're talking about a tropical disturbance across the mid-Atlantic. It's at the moment a disorganised area of showers and thunderstorms, but it's really quite big. And the National Hurricane Centre is suggesting possibly over the next few days, a 50 percent chance it could form into something more coherent. So that's one part of the story. But more interesting for us here in the UK and forecast is what is going to happen next. And at the moment, there are so many scenarios. The computer model is suggesting it could go west, it could go east. So, Aidan, let's first of all talk about the chance that this storm could track towards Newfoundland. Yes, there is a chance and some of the latest computer model runs are producing a track that pushes this disturbance or this developing tropical storm towards Newfoundland. Now, that would ultimately push a lot of warm air, humid air, moisture, energy towards Newfoundland, the other side of the Atlantic. And as that warmth pushes north, then it also pushes the jet stream further north. And the jet stream already is quite amplified. It's very twisty turny across the Atlantic. It's pushing a big uh, area of high pressure into Greenland, and then it's coming south again across the UK. So if you imagine another thing that then amplifies that pattern further, and you get another push of northerly winds over the UK, if that scenario happened, And if that was the result, then you'd get even colder air arriving across the UK through next week. And Alex Deacon talks about the next 10 days in some detail, including the uncertainty relative to that in his 10 day trend. You can check that out on our Met Office YouTube channel. So that's the picture pretty much across the UK for the next few days. It's staying cold, Aidan. 
distribution of showers will just come and go. As you say, they're going to be hit and miss. But what we can tell you is that it's still going to remain very cold into the first part of next week. Yeah, that's right. So we've got high confidence that the cold weather is here to stay until at least Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. And then it's all about the track of that uh, developing tropical storm. If it avoids the UK, it's staying cold. If it pushes through the UK, we see milder weather return. And somewhere in between, of course, that mild air and its wet weather mixes with the cold air. There's the potential for something interesting to happen. So many different scenarios, but we're talking about six or seven days away. It's not unusual to have this kind of uncertainty at that range. We're pretty confident up until then, it's going to be cold, frosty and icy by night, chilly by day, many places sunny, but some wintry showers about. And also watch out for some freezing fog as well. It, that would be patchy, but pretty horrible if you run into it, particularly if you're driving in it. OK, so that's the forecast for the next few days. Aidan, thank you very much. Before we go, let's head over to Ollie Claydon with last week's highs and lows. Here are your weekly weather extremes for Monday the 28th of November to Sunday the 4th of December. The highest daily maximum temperature was on Wednesday the 30th of November at St Mary's Airport in the Isles of Scilly with 13.1 Celsius recorded. Wednesday also saw the coldest temperatures. Readings for the early hours in Aviemore in Venetia showed minus 6 degrees. The wettest place was Wick Airport in Caithness with 15.6 millimetres of rain on Thursday. And finally, Camborne in Cornwall enjoyed the sunniest day again on Thursday with a total of seven hours of sunshine. Thanks, Ollie. And my huge thanks to Aidan McGiven, who obviously brings lots of insight and wisdom. You just love talking weather, don't you? (laughs) Lifelong passion. (laughs) It really is. (laughs) Okay, and that's all from me, Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.